Thank you for attending the second annual TEACH conference. I'm Francis Vigent, CEO of No Adam. We're happy to uh, be sponsoring this event today. I'd like to recognize a few folks uh, who have really gone out of their way to be here today to celebrate really many of the top teachers in the country uh, when it comes to K-8 science are in this room, and it's, it's actually quite humbling. And so we have with us today the Commissioner Jeffrey Riley for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have a number of superintendents, uh, Cynthia Parrish, superintendent of Lawrence Public Schools, Dr. Scott Morrison, superintendent of Tritown Schools, and a number of, if I miss anybody too, I apologize, I tried to catch you all as you were coming in the door. Uh, a number of folks who really were working behind the scenes to make today possible um, in the trenches. We had Dr. Mary Toomey, assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction for Lawrence Public Schools, one of our uh, great partners. Uh, Dr. Christine Kelly, assistant superintendent for Reading Public Schools. Dr. Patrick Daly, who I'm not sure could make it today uh, because he's running another regional conference, uh, assistant superintendent of North Reading Public Schools. And Mr. Mark Stefanski, who is the STEM curriculum director for K-12 at Whitman Hanson Public Schools. Uh, these folks really, along with my wonderful staff, uh, Nicole, Sarah, Dom, Mary Ellen, Kim, uh, who you may have interacted with today, uh, have really tried to bring together an event where we can help the best of the best become even better. Uh, and one of the things that's unique about this event is we found ourselves, and just give you a little bit of history, found ourselves sitting around saying, how, how do you help folks that are really on the wet edge, the cutting edge of what's happening? You can't really just go hire somebody to help because the people who really know what's going on, the people who do it best are in the classrooms making it happen. And so we really came to the idea that what we needed to do is create a space where those folks could come together, share their ideas, share their practices with others so that we could learn from each other, uh, just the way that we expect our children to. And so TEACH was born. And you know, you wouldn't be dealing with education if you didn't have an acronym. So TEACH is, of course, an acronym. It's technique exchange allows change to happen. And so that's what we're here for. I'd like to give a couple shout outs to a couple other folks that are joining us. The Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, Ms. Kara um, Pekarsik, I'm sorry if I'm not getting that quite right, um, who will be talking about phenomena-driven instruction using a No Adam lesson on whales up in the junior ballroom during session B. And I'd also like to recognize the accomplishments of North Reading Public Schools, who's also one of our partners here. The Hood and the Bachelor School this year placed number one and number two in the state. Yeah, that's quite something. So to give you a sense of their accomplishment, this district, um, and these two schools in particular, the average performance for a fifth grade class on the common assessment program here is 50% proficient or greater. The Hood School had 68% of their students in advanced alone, and over 90% were proficient or greater. As a district, they well outpaced the state. And it's not just because of one fifth grade teacher or, or one talented person here or there, it's because it's actually a team effort. It's a group of talented people who are coming together, sharing their instructional practices, and again, sort of the spirit of the event here today. By the way, Miss Whitney Cleary, uh, who was a grade eight, uh, sorry, grade five teacher from Hood, one of those schools is going to be leading a workshop in uh, session B on maker spaces. So the last bit, and I've overstayed my welcome here, is just a little bit to frame the day about our theme. So our theme today is making thinking visible with a growth mindset. Why are we here? Researcher Carol Dweck, I think, put it best when she described a fixed mindset with the common tale of the tortoise and the hare. And of course, you know it. The uh, gifted hare sprints ahead of the plodding tortoise, but along the way falls asleep, or it gets lazy, assuming he'd win the race. And so the slow but steady tortoise plods along and finishes ahead. Um, and Carol looks at this as a, as a view of a fixed mindset because who is expected to win the race? Who should have won the race? And 
we're here because we don't believe our classrooms and our world is full of tortoises and hares. We really embrace the power of what's yet to be in our children's lives and in our schools and in our classrooms. And so, as you go from session to session today, we haven't uh, done anything to change anybody's opinion of whatever they would share today. It is each presenter's own opinion and own practice. Um, go, into that go into that session as a classroom and, and think about that power of yet, um, how that teacher is embracing um, their classroom as a place where students can become even more. And that brings me to the last piece of our uh, theme for today, which is making thinking visible. Why would we care about that? Well, thinking serves to deepen understanding, as I'm sure you all know. And David Perkins once said that learning is a consequence of thinking. You'll hear a lot about making thinking visible today, because when we make thinking visible in the classroom, it becomes more concrete and real. It becomes something we can talk about, explore, and push around, and challenge, and learn from. For the people in this room who are on the cutting edge, who want to be on the cutting edge, who want to go even further for their students, um, it's not about the quick and easy answer. It's about engaging students in developing and refining frameworks of knowledge and leaving them with a skill set that's going to be useful for the rest of their lives, not some standardized test that comes and goes. So with that, I would like to introduce our commissioner here in Massachusetts, Mr. Jeffrey Riley, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So thank you, Mr. Commissioner, welcome. For the next two hours, I'd like to review the rules and regulations of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Good morning, everyone. Let us begin with a few words of wisdom from that American poet, Jack Handy. And my personal favorite. I was a middle school principal, so I can be forgiven for my presentation today. <laughs> if you had to spend decades with 13-year-old children, hundreds and hundreds of them, your presentation might be off as well. <laughs> I'm here today to, to say uh, welcome, good morning, thank you all for being here. Excited to see my Lawrence people in the house. Hello, Lawrence people. <laughs> They're clapping for themselves, not for me, because they know. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna have to hear him again. Uh, it's great to be here. I guess what I really wanna say is, um, we, as an educational community, need to understand that our kids need to be truly, deeply engaged, and because they are, and they need to be challenged, and their minds are always working. And I'll give you just a few examples. When I was a principal in Boston, we did a candy sale, and one morning at about 6.30, I was in, getting ready for the school day, and I got a call from an irate neighbor. Now, as a principal in Charlestown, which is a very uh, unique community, and when local townies from Charlestown call you, you take their phone calls very seriously. And this was a townie grandmother who called me, yelling and screaming at me at 6 in the morning, 6.30. How could you do this? Are you out of your mind? What's wrong with you? I said, ma'am, what's going on? She just kept yelling. This is ridiculous, I'm outraged, I can't believe this is happening. I said, ma'am, what's the problem? And she said, it's your candy sale. I said, I think every school in America does a candy scale. She said, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, all right, what are you talking about? The price. And I said, I don't think a dollar is too much to ask for a candy bar. And she said, a dollar? Your kids are selling them for five. <laughs> Now, Anthony got in trouble on that day, <laughs> but there wasn't a part of me that didn't admire his capitalistic, entrepreneurial, critical thinking skills that he brought to the table. 
And it's unfortunate that we don't teach business ethics in seventh grade, but because he, he was ready for them. We were not. Our children have amazing minds that are always at work. On the other end of the spectrum, I have a good friend of mine who went to Harvard University undergraduate. And he went to the Harvard-Yale game. Are you all familiar with this big, important football game? And if you go to the Harvard-Yale game, whether it's at Harvard or in uh, Yale, uh, one of the things they have is this sea of porta parties just like endless rows and of porta potties all lined up right next to each other. And uh, he and his friends had had a few adult beverages, although I'm told the drinking age is 21. Um, and uh, when one of their friends went into the porta potty, the group decided it would be a good idea to turn the porta potty over on him. And so as a group, they went, they turned the porta potty over, and uh, obviously that's not a very pleasant experience. And then they watched with their mouths open as their friend actually walked out of the porta potty that was still open right next door. <laughs> These are Harvard kids. We need to be challenging our children still to this day. You all know what a blue book is? Yes? Fifteen years ago at a Midwestern university with a really good football team, Catholic, uh, there was a class on Irish literature. And what should have been the beauty of James Joyce or Yeats was butchered by a professor who not only didn't like his subject, but didn't like the kids. Nonetheless, the kids filed in in December. It was the end of the term. They were getting ready to go home for their winter break, and they were going to take their final exam. And he said, you have 60 minutes to take this test. Get your blue book, start writing. And so the hundreds of kids diligently got their blue book and then went up in their rows. It was like an amphitheater seating where the professor was on the ground and the kids were up in rows uh, in the auditorium. And they started writing in their blue book. With about 15 minutes left in the exam, he started yelling at them. You only have 15 minutes left. That's it, not one more minute. Well, that caused about half the class to close their blue books. They were so sick of this guy and say, I've had enough. Walk down the stairs and start stacking the blue books up on the hall, uh, up on the desk and heading out for their winter vacation. With five minutes left, there were only a handful of kids left. He said, you only have five minutes. Well, that caused everyone but one kid to close their blue book, walk down the stairs and, and put their blue book on this ever increasing stack of blue books that was on the professor's desk. At the 60 minute mark, the professor said, time's up, get down here right now, to the one kid who was still writing in his blue book. But the kid ignored the professor, and he kept just writing in his blue book, writing, writing, writing. The professor couldn't believe it. I said, get down here right now, time is up. The kid just kept casually writing in his blue book, calmly, calmly, calmly. This went on for about seven to 10 minutes, which may not seem like a long time, but when a university professor is screaming at you and you're the only one in the room, it's probably an eternity. After about 10 minutes, the kid just calmly closes his blue book. He walks down the stairs to the professor who's in his face. He's almost spitting in his face. He's so angry. I'm going to fail you. Didn't you hear what I said? And he's just in this kid's face. And, and the kid says very calmly, professor, you don't know my name, do you? Professor says, what? The kid says very calmly, serenely almost. You don't know my name, do you? And the professor says, no, it doesn't matter. I'm going to fail you anyway. And the kid says, no, you're not because of this. And he takes his blue book and he shoves it in the middle of the pile, knocks it over, and runs out the door. <laughs> Our children need to be engaged. Their minds are always at work. And we need to meet them with great instruction. I'm reminded of a very obscure island somewhere almost equidistant between India, Africa, and Australia. Very remote place. And in the 19th century, some English folks, shoe salesmen from two different companies, went to this island and one telegraphed back, situation hopeless. The locals don't wear shoes. And the other company, the guy from the other company said, amazing opportunity. They don't wear shoes. And we as educators need to figure out 
how we're going to deal with our lives in these classrooms. We can take a downward kind of spiral approach, a negative approach, or we could think of the possibility of where we're trying to go and what we're trying to do. Education for 25 years, this era of ed reform, I'm telling people, is over. There's been some good things. There's been some not so good things. Um, and we need to close the chapter and figure out what's next. What I've said to people is, I think we've spent a lot of time on systems and structures, on accountability and test scores. We need to get back to focusing on instruction and deep teaching and learning. We need to start celebrating and supporting our teachers, who are the people that do the real work every day with our kids. The Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, give yourselves a round of applause. Hey. The Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, Jamil Siddiqui, 24-year veteran math teacher from East Bridgewater High School. 20 of his former students are now teachers in Massachusetts, 15 of whom are now math teachers like him. And when I met with him, do you know what he complained about? He doesn't have the time to talk to his colleagues. This is an amazing educator. We should be hooking his brain up into every new math teacher in the state. And yet he doesn't even have time to talk to the people in his building, much less people across the state. And so how do we as a community make the time and space for our teachers to actually talk to each other and to focus on what matters? We know what the state standards are. And so we have to figure out how to marry those standards to either great curriculum or using our own ability to create curriculum, great tasks, and engaging activities. You're going to hear from Dr. Richard Elmore later today. The man is a genius. He does some work around um, medical rounds. Are you familiar with this? We all walk around like doctors and observe classrooms. I'm not sure I actually believe in that. I, I like to kid him about that. But uh, what he talks deeply about is this idea that task predicts performance. And what he means by that is the activity or task that we have that is married to that standard will determine the quality of learning for a student. If you tell kids, you're going to learn slope of a line today, and you show them the algorithm or the formula, and you say, you're going to do numbers 1 to 50, go. And it's Friday, and you know, maybe you only have to do the odd number problems. Versus showing kids not just the formula, but having them map it in the context of asthma rates in their own community, having them write a letter to the editor about that, right? making the, the learning meaningful to kids so that it sticks in their brains. They're more likely to retain it. We've done 100 plus years of education where we give kids tests. They try to memorize the information the night before. They take the test, and then what happens? They forget it. Yes. That is very different than actually learning and being engaged in it. We are losing children throughout this commonwealth because we are not engaging them in deep tasks in pedagogy. Children we know learn through play, and yet we beat that out of them by the time they're in second grade and make them sit in rows and fold their hands. And we are losing a generation of boys, many of whom are kinesthetic learners because of it, and some girls too, because kids need to be engaged in their learning. Learning needs to be fun and playful. And how do we get back to doing that? We brought in No Adam because we thought that this is a curriculum that is actually engaging for our kids, that it's interesting. We need more of that. Task predicts performance. I was at STEM week. I think it was last week. I don't know. It's all one long day to me. Um, and I saw children shooting rockets. And I saw children building irrigation systems. And I saw children cutting open the hearts of, and brains of calves. And I thought, this is what we need in education. We need this kind of hands-on learning, working in groups, working cooperatively with a detailed task that's aligned to the standard, but that is engaging for our kids. They were so engaged, I can't even begin to tell you. 
And my fear is, after STEM week ends, we'll go back to sitting in rows and lecturing from the front of the class. And that's not how I learned, and I hope that we change how we do that as an educational community. Teachers are fundamentally everything. Some of you know I have two children. I have a 15-year-old. They both uh, go to the Boston Public Schools, and they have since they were little. Uh, my 15-year-old is a traditionally performing student in some ways. He's a genius. He's too smart for his own good, but in, he's incredibly bored, uh, and he spends most of his time playing Fortnite. Uh, he's not engaged. Uh, and I have a daughter who has had some pretty significant special needs since she was younger. And uh, when she went to kindergarten, she was going to have to wear a weight vest. She was going to have to have those elastics on the bottom of her chair. She would need movement breaks throughout the day, OT, PT, and speech services. And we were scared to death that she was going to hate school, that she was going to be bullied, that she was going to feel different. But she never felt that way because she had these amazing teachers that took care of her. And every day, from the age of 5 to the age of 12, when I would come home, she would run to the door and say, Daddy, Daddy, let's play school. Now, Daddy's played a lot of school. <laughs> but I played with her because she just loved it. And I didn't need to go to a parent conference because I knew what was happening in that classroom. I mean, she was, Maya was serious about playing school. She had her objective up. The do now was ready. <laughs> there were exit tickets. Uh, my critique of her, which she never responded to, was that I thought recess was too short and there wasn't enough bathroom break or lunchtime. Um, I, would, I do like to think that the squirt gun she used as a disciplinary device against me <laughs> was her own personal flair and not what was happening in the class, otherwise I probably should have called social services. Um, but she was channeling the teacher because she loves school. And now that she's 13, and as we get ready to send her to the convent, we know like, <laughs> what an amazing human she's become. And I, she's either going to be literally this amazing teacher, because I think she's going to wind up teaching special ed, uh, or she's going to take over the world. Um, and it really depends on her mood that day. Um, but what I try to explain to her is it's actually the same thing, because teaching is taking over the world. You have these children in front of you, and you never know what they're going to become. I have a student of mine when I was a middle school principal um, here with us today. Um, she's become a teacher herself. She came and worked for me in my district in Lawrence, and now she told me today she's having a baby. Oh. I, you know what I said to her? I said, she would have been a good mother when she was in seventh grade. She was so responsible. What an amazing child, right? And so we have to remember that these children in front of us grow up to become adults. And the potential that they have is shocking. What they can do is unbelievable. And we need to unleash that on them. We need to see the kid who's selling the candy bar for $5, or the kid who's, who's smart enough to figure out, this guy doesn't even know my name. Screw him. right? We need to match them and give them the very best instruction that they can get. People ask me all the time, what is good teaching, and I could spend seven to 10 days just speaking about quality teaching and learning. Um, instead, what I've done is uh, I've gone around the state and showed this video, which I think encapsulates what I think good teaching is all about.
So the first time I showed this video, my intention had been to go out in the audience and have a discussion, but there were so many crybabies in the room, <laughs> I couldn't do that. So uh, what I want to say to you is, if you watch this video, I see the father as being the teacher. This is a man who literally taught his son how to run track, who took him to all the track meets as a kid, who helped him get all the way to the Olympics, right? And when this ugly situation happened, when he blew out his hamstring and he faltered, his father came to his side. What's interesting to me, there's a couple things that I see in the video. Um, the father is continually pulling his son's hand away from his face, as if to say, keep your head up. But maybe the most important part of the video is at the end, where the father doesn't finish the race with him, but lets him do it by himself. And if that's not the definition of good teaching, we teach our kids, we put them through their paces. When they make a mistake or fall down, we help them get back up, and then we send them on their way. I don't know what is. We have an amazing job, my friends. We get to work with kids all day. They have unbelievable abilities. Let's make sure that we get them what they need. Thank you for everything you do. Goodbye now.